this Northwest competition started in the 50s and soon became a regular feature of the event. I believe in miracles. You such a thing, such a thing, you. The circus rolls into town when the Northwest 200 happens, so in this Northwest 200 is synonymous with that whole circus atmosphere. It was stopped for a few years because uh, one of the sponsors uh, thought it wasn't politically correct, but let's face it, we're talking bikers here and bikers like to look at females and uh, all the glamour, I think that's all come back again. And it's just gone from strength to strength. It's good for the girls, um, and for sure it's good for the riders. Miss Northwest 200, 2007, please give her a big round of applause. It's Kirsty Weir. It was a fabulous experience. It was the first year that Miss Northwest had come back, so it was a real buzz. The following year, Laura McNally daughter of former race winner, the late Owen McNally, was crowned Miss Northwest. Everyone was so nice and, you know, just chatting and telling me all about Dad's memories and stuff, so it was very nice to be there. As the troubles here made headlines worldwide, the organisers were struggling to attract big name riders from across the water. We used to read in the paper about the troubles in Northern Ireland all the time. We only ever saw bad stuff coming out of Northern Ireland. And to be honest, we went there with a lot of trepidation and we arrived there and of course we had an absolutely brilliant time. During the 70s, Sammy Patton was one of the many volunteers who helped to build the course. He was stopped one night on the old bridge by the army. And the army was just about to pull the car off the road because he had special length pieces of wire. He had steeples, he had hammers, he had all this stuff. And uh, luckily a local policeman came along and he explained he's just getting ready for a motorbike race and that's what all the equipment's for. I think they thought he was heading off somewhere. And the troubles were to give the organisers even more headaches. 72, unfortunately, we didn't get going because uh, the government uh, decided that it wouldn't be safe, uh, poor Stuart especially would be cut off and if there was a problem, bomb scar or something like that, then the army couldn't get in. Uh, so we gave in that year uh, and we didn't run the Northwest. Racing was allowed again in 1973 when the organisers agreed to avoid the town of Port Stuart, reducing the course by two miles. The following year, the first treble at the Northwest was won by Englishman John Williams. During the 70s, fans of the Northwest began forming rival clubs to support their local heroes like Joey Dunlop from the Armoy Armada and Ray McCulloch from the Dramara Destroyers. We just felt that they were just people like ourselves and they just had a passion and they were playing out their passion on the, the road circus and on the tracks. It was just great. Although it was very intense rivalry on the track, we would have all chipped in to sort each other's bikes out and it was a, a great time to be involved. In 1976, like many years at the Northwest 200, the weather was less than clement. Rain, the incessant unyielding kind which only Ireland can produce, puts paid to any hopes of a new lap record for the opening 350cc event. In 76 I remember the water running down the road and they had to sweep it off the road. It was such such a heavy rain. We got into Metropole Station and um, the first place we went was straight down to the shops to buy really hats for the children because it was so cold whenever we got there. But whatever the weather, there's always been a hardcore of Northwest supporters who've worked tirelessly to raise money to try to keep the event going. 1977, just the first badge. The badge changes every year. We have hats, t-shirts, polo shirts, and the usual goodies that people like to buy. 
but it gives you a great feeling whenever you're able to go and hand over a lot of money to the race. In 1977, as moviegoers were treated to the first installment of Star Wars, fans at the Northwest were treated to stuntman Dave Taylor wheeling round the entire course. As well as the famous battle between local man Ray McCulloch number one and English writer Tony Rutter number six. Most of the local fans were wanting their local writer to win, but I mean, Tony had fantastic skill too. We were together the whole race, and uh, it was just a matter of slipstreaming each other. I thought at the time I'd won, but you know. Ray was my hero in those days, and it just, all the locals wanted it to have been Ray who had won. I think everyone enjoyed it, didn't they? The dead heat of Ray McCulloch and Tony Rutter was one that will always be remembered. I mean, it just, it just couldn't split them. It was amazing. 1978 saw the fastest lap time at the Northwest. County Down man Tom Heron averages a speed of over 127 miles per hour. Subsequent safety improvements to the course mean that in over 30 years, this record still hasn't been broken. By the late 70s, crowds in excess of 100,000 were regularly coming to the event to see their local heroes compete with the international stars. Those really were fantastic times. And then, of course, the English riders coming over, Roger Marshall, Charlie Williams, Steve Parrish. It was lovely to see the big wagons coming onto the paddock. Accessibility was something that we hadn't been used to, you know, you, you weren't locked away behind any fences, you know, everybody could walk in your awning and come and see what was going on and bring your burgers and cups of tea and it was just a fantastic atmosphere. In 1979 the sun shone on the 50th anniversary meeting and rising star Joey Dunlop got his first two Northwest wins. 1979 is a race that nobody will ever forget because that was the blackest day for the Northwest. That just was the day that will be remembered for all the wrong reasons. Lap record holder Tom Heron and Scottish rider Brian Hamilton were killed that day. Frank Kennedy later died in hospital. Complete or not Devastating shock, you know, and that was the last motorcycle race I went to. It certainly made us all think about, you know, what we were doing and, you know, is this really worth carrying on? Uh, and sort of decided then that, no, stick at it and try uh, and, and make it safer and try and improve things. Despite course changes in the early 80s, the event claimed the lives of Suzuki Works rider John Newbold and local Armoy Armada man Mervyn Robinson, Joey Dunlop's brother-in-law. Since his first race at the Northwest, Mervyn's son Paul has been trying to win the event in memory of his father. I'd made a vow to myself I'd never leave or even my dad's grave. And I would never do it until I won the Northwest. And there is the checkered flag for Paul Robinson. For it to actually become a reality was quite a thing. Such an emotional moment for him and the whole family of course. Over the, the next few years the council and the local DOE people were absolutely brilliant. You know they helped us to get the chicanes in, they helped us to move telegraph poles. Everybody was so enthusiastic about the whole thing. I mean, that's what kept the thing going. As well as the teams of volunteer marshals who continue to police the course right up to today. We built up a, a very strong team of guys who were experienced, knew what to do, um, warn other riders rather than go to the, the assistance of the guy who came off. In 
In 1985, while Princess Diana visited Northern Ireland, Joey Dunlop notched up his eighth Northwest win. By the end of the decade, he would bring his total to a staggering 13. He said to me one time, he says, you know, once Northwest 200 weeks over, both you and the bike are ready for the skip. Why do you feel the TT's more relaxed? Of course. Oh, it does, a long way. The Northwest wasn't Joey's favourite circuit, so there's no doubt he much preferred the TT and the Ulster. But, oh, it was a close one because there was dog ran out in front of him, go down the road from Corian to Porchrouse, so, ah, oh, you think, oh, dear. Uh, and he won that year. One of Joey's most exciting races was in 1988, when he was up against Steve Cole from Bangor. I was leading that race from the start to finish, and the last lap fell off your corner, and Joey got past me. And you was the last lap, and you were, me and Steve was away ahead, and I said to myself, just take it easy. You know, Joey thought Steve was down and it was all over, but Stephen had other ideas. I can remember Joey looking behind him, going underneath the railway bridge, and then he fell off because he was right up his backside. I looked right and Stephen was sitting in the back way. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> I passed him in the shoreline before the before the starting finish to win the race. But it was his day and he won the race. It meant a lot to me because falling off and remounting again to win the race was Suburb for me. <laughs> Joey's brother Robert was also disappointed at the Northwest 200 that year. He was interviewed the day after with young son William on his knee. Then in the second race, I was trying to go a bit harder. And uh, when I met before, I thought I just. Every year after the excitement on the course, the race fans party. Someone say yesterday, it's a pity we have motorcycle racing here, it spoils the social life. <laughs> social life here is brilliant, it really is. I can't remember any time in my career where I've had a better time socially than the Northwest 200. The actual crack there is memorable. The Northwest managed to survive the recessionary 80s with the help of several loyal local sponsors.